without further ado, uh, we are going to hear from our very own Dan Davis. Uh, he talked to us a couple weeks ago about the topic of marriage. And then last week we heard from Luke Zappa on the topic of friendships. And now this week we get to hear from Dan again to effectively complete the Luke sandwich uh, that we have going on here at Crew. So we're definitely looking forward to hearing what Dan has to share with us tonight. Um, and just one fun thing that I have to share about Dan is that I got to meet him when he was moving into Pittsburgh about nine months ago or so. And literally like from the time I met him, it was super easy to talk to him. And I think that that's really held true in the times that I've met with him since. And so uh, I just wanted to say that he is definitely looking forward to meeting a bunch of you this Saturday at Spring Retreat. Uh, so make sure that you get a chance to talk with him there because he would love to meet with all of you. So without further ado, let's welcome up Dan. Thanks guys, I better unmute first before I start talking. Um, yeah, I am super excited for Spring Retreat and actually see people in, in person. Um, it's always funny to see people on Zoom first and then see them in person and be like, wow, he was a lot taller than I thought or shorter. And so it'd be fun to actually see like people uh, in, in real size. So <clears throat> anyway, so there, uh, you guys are probably familiar with musician um, Macklemore and Ryan Lewis. Uh, they came out with a song several years ago called Same Love. Um, I didn't know much about it then, but a Facebook friend posted a section of the lyrics on, on Facebook, and uh, I just wanted to share an excerpt for, of it. Um, I think they'll put it up on the screen, but it says, uh, America the brave still fears what we don't know, and God loves all his children is somehow forgotten, but we paraphrase a book written 3,500 years ago. I know Macklemore's song is going after a whole other topic, but that last line is so relevant to tonight's talk. I feel like this is probably the average person's view of the Bible. It's really old, it's not reliable, not relevant, and it's annoying that people try to use it to tell me how to live. So if you were asked about like why you trust the Bible, what would you say? And so <clears throat> tonight we're going to talk about the Bible, why it's relevant today, the potential power it has in our lives. And one verse I kind of want to use throughout tonight is Hebrews 4.12, and it reads, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the visions of soul and spirit, of joints and of morrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So it's one or the other, right? It's either an out-of-date, irrelevant book, or it's true, and it's living, and it's active and power, powerful in our lives today. So as followers of Jesus, we believe the Bible is more than just a book. We believe it's revelation, a special revelation. So <clears throat> there's... Um, so there's only so much that we can ascertain about God from nature in this world. And so it was necessary for him to reveal himself in special ways. He didn't have to, but he wanted to. And so God chose to reveal himself to mankind in a relatable way for us. And he did so by the holy book, the Bible. Not only that, um, but God wrote himself into mankind's history. Uh, Tim Keller has an analogy of it's like Shakespeare writing himself into his own play. In a similar way, God came to earth as Jesus, the incarnation, the God-man, and he wrote himself into, into our story. And so the Bible is just not revealing propositional truths or rules about God that we need to kind of agree with, but he's revealing uh, the offer of a relationship with a very personal God. But why would we believe this? You know, because the Bible is really old. But luckily for you and for me, the more time goes on, um, the more evidence we have to believe that the scriptures are reliable. So now I'm, I'm gonna, tonight I'm going to go through and focus on a few evidences um, of many that pertain mainly to the Gospels, you know, in the Gospels, which are the four stories of uh, Jesus. Um, I'm going to focus on that because a lot rides on Jesus. Because if what Jesus did is true, that alone should call us to a response. And it really puts the rest of scripture to be very um, credible. So I want to jump into the first thing I want to share with you guys that persuades me to think that the Bible is reliable is the manuscript evidence um, that we have. And I want to use a, a specific example of uh, that being John Ryland's papyrus. So before I get into some of the manuscript evidence, um, I want to mention that in the year 1611, the first English Bible was produced. It was the King James Bible. And at that time, they had seven Greek manuscripts. And so Greek is the original language of the New Testament. And of those seven copies they used to make the King James Bible, the oldest ones dated back to the 11th century. Now, the New Testament was written in the first century. 
So there was a gap of 10 centuries between those copies and the originals. But since then, we now have what scholars call an embarrassment of riches. We have, I think it's over 5,800 Greek manuscripts with some dating back to just decades from the originals. Not to mention some of those Greek manuscripts, but we have found lots of other manuscripts in other languages like Aramaic, which was the language Jesus spoke, or Coptic or Arabic, Old Georgian, Latin, etc. And it's amazing with all like the increase in volume and the increase of age of manuscripts that the King James is still a reliable translation. But <clears throat> let's get back to that earliest Greek manuscript, uh, which is John Ryland's Papyrus. So I can't quite see it, but if you guys, I think there's a picture that'll come up of the actual fragment of the John Ryland's Papyrus. And so this is a uh, part of John 18. Uh, John was the, the last living eyewitness of Jesus. And of the gospels, he wrote the gospel of John last around 85 to 95 AD. And he did this in Ephesus, which is in modern day Turkey. And so um, this piece of John 18, <clears throat> this papyrus was found though in Egypt and it's dated to be around 100 to 130 AD, the latest 150, but I think most people say between 100 and 130. And so a copy that is just 30 years or just uh, several decades from the original writing is kind of unbelievable with what we, we kind of came from. And it's even possible that this papyrus is a copy from the original manuscript, which would be kind of crazy. Now, this is a very small fragment because it's so old, but on the average, Greek manuscripts um, average around 450 pages, so that we just do have a wealth, wealth of uh, New Testament information. Now, some verses on this papyrus is uh, verses 37 and 38, and they're about Jesus on trial before Pontius Pilate. And Pilate is asking if he is a king, and Jesus says, quote, you are right in saying I'm a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world. To, fit, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And so it's awesome that even though this is a small fragment, it contains such a key element in the gospel with Jesus on trial, claiming to be a king in front of the historical figure of Pilate. And, and so even too, for this papyrus to, to make it to Egypt, it had to be copied and sent from Asia, from Turkey, within just 30 years or less. And so this really doesn't leave that much room for errors or legends to grow. Now, still, not everyone is convinced. Um, there's still, yeah, lots of skepticism out there. And uh, one example of that is that there's a very popular book out by Bart Ehrman, who's a New Testament scholar. And the title of his book is called Misquoting Jesus, The Story Behind Who Changed the Bible and Why. Now, with kind of this growth of so many manuscripts of the New Testament now, um, some of the ancient copiers we found have made errors, some have added explanatory notes, some try to reward it or make it more clear. And with his book, Bart really, Bart Ehrman really focuses on a few passages where this is debated about what's the original writing, and he uses that to cast doubt on the entire Bible. You know, the reasoning, if, if someone tried to change the text here, then how can we trust any of it? And so to many, this is a very compelling argument. And I, I'm gonna be afraid to know the thousands of people who have read this book or similar books and have walked away from Jesus because of it. Because even, uh, yeah, I think what I'll share next is really interesting. Like in, in, the, in one of the paperback versions of this misquoting Jesus, there's an appendix added and Bart is interviewed by some of the editors of the book. And he is asked, and I'll put the whole question up, it says, Bruce Metzger, your mentor in textual criticism to whom this book is dedicated, has said that there is nothing in these, script these variants of scripture that challenge any essential Christian belief, e.g. the bodily resurrection of Jesus, the Trinity. Why do you believe these core tenets of Christian orthodoxy to be in jeopardy based on the scribal errors you discovered in the biblical manuscripts? I, I couldn't believe this when I read this, but this is part of Bart's answer. He says, the position I argue for in misquoting Jesus does not actually stand at odds with Professor Metzger's position that the essential Christian beliefs are not affected by textual variants in the manuscripts traditions of the New Testament. What he means by that, I think, is that even if one or two passages that are used to argue for a belief have different textual reading, they are still, there are still other passages that could be used to argue for that same belief. For the most part, I think that's true. 
men and women, that is absolutely true. The most important verses that we use to point to the essentials of our doctrines, the divinity of Christ, the bodily resurrection, are rock solid, and they read exactly the same all the way back. The second thing I want to share is um, this is very per persuasive for me is the lives of the disciples themselves portrayed in the Gospels before and after the crucifixion. The 12 disciples lived and did ministry with Jesus for three years. They watched him do miracles, learned his teachings, and Jesus tells them that his ministry will end with his death. But Peter and the 12 vow to remain loyal no matter what. Now, when Jesus gets arrested, he's, you know, we see in the confusion what the disciples actually do. In Mark 14, I mean, it briefly says in verse 50, and they all left him and fled. And in 51, it goes on to say that a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. Every disciple ran away and hid. Peter denies Jesus three times. And so let's be honest, it wasn't their best day. But let's remember that these are the ones who wrote the story we now call scripture. They themselves admit to this cowardly behavior. And yet, three days later, they claim to have seen the risen Lord. At that moment, something changes with the disciples. All of them, except John, die as martyrs because they refuse to say it's not true. Now, I know people from many faiths might be willing to die for what they believe, but only these guys are eyewitnesses, and they know if it's true or not. They knew and they acted like this. I'm going to share another passage in Acts 4. This is Peter and John before the Jewish, Jewish council on trial, kind of like Jesus. Their lives are on the line. And uh, this is what it says in 18. It says, so they called the apostles back in and commanded them never again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. One day they are running from their lives and this day they're ready and willing to lay their lives down. Psychologically, nothing but seeing the risen Lord could change all 12 men. We move on to the third thing that persuades me the Bible is rela uh, reliable is that I think the details found in the Gospels that tie it to a specific location in a specific time period. I think one, inter one interesting detail are names. So names in most cultures um, become popular for a while and then they kind of fade away. Um, on the staff team I was a part of at Northwestern University, there was nine women on the staff team. Five of the nine were all named Emily. We never used their first name. We just called them by their last name, Gerst, Lanning, Shand. I don't know if I could even, yeah, still call them probably just by the last names. Now, in first century Israel, it was being occupied by Rome, and they dreamed of freedom from their oppressors. And along that line of thinking, the most popular names in their time were names that came from a family that were the last Jewish rulers of the last independent Israel. So these names were patriotic, and they were rebellious. Now, outside of Israel, Jews living elsewhere had very different names, but they've kind of, historians and archeologists have gathered like legal documents, inscriptions, burial markers, and they've accumulated thousands of names from first century Israel. And so here's some data from the list of Jewish male names they found through archeology span in, in Israel. And some, I got this from a book called Jesus and the Eyewitnesses by Richard Bachman. So the first, um, I guess table, the first half, is names found in archaeological records of first century Israel. So just what they found um, kind of lying around. 15% of men bore one of the two most popular names, Simon and Joseph. 41% of men bore one of the most, like the nine most popular names. And then only 7% had like just one name that was attested to. Compare that to um, the most popular male names found in the Gospels and Acts. 18% bore Simon and Joseph, 40% the most nine most popular names mentioned, and then 3% if the name was only mentioned once. It's kind of crazy that lines up so well. And this is not luck. This is kind of amazing because the most common criticism of the Gospels is that they are written too far after the actual historical events. And the criticism would say that the Gospels were actually multiple generations of oral tradition before they were written down. But based on the data, I don't know if that's quite an option. Like later creations would have never guessed the popular names of that day, especially since Jerusalem was just like destroyed completely by Rome in 70 AD. 
And so not very many people survived. We've only been able to find out that information now through archeology. span So general, like generations of oral tradition eventually break down in losing details, especially names. So there's a, a couple of things I mentioned tonight that, um, and I think there is so much more out there that persuades me the Bible is indeed reliable. Now scholarship has grown with time that supports the Bible, but public opinion of the Bible has not grown. It has only gone down. Thinking back to Macklemore's lyrics, his low view of the Bible probably demonstrates so many others view as well. I would guess that if I presented good evidence of the Bible to Macklemore, he would probably shrug his shoulders and walk away and not really wrestle with what I said. Why do I think that? Here's a quote from E. Paul Hovey. He says, men, men and women, do not reject the Bible because it contradicts itself, but because it contradicts them. I wager that most people don't believe in the Bible because they don't want to. It's inconvenient. And personally, I can relate to that. <clears throat> Before I became a follower of Jesus, someone gave me a Bible. And now I looked at it, but I didn't get it at all. And because mainly I didn't want to. I wanted to live for myself. And that's what I was trying to do. And I did hold on to that Bible, but I kind of only looked its way when, I, um, when living for myself wasn't working. And sadly, I only wanted to pull something from it to help me get back to living for myself. So, and I, I, I realized uh, later on that my desire to live for myself was the very thing that separated me from God. Jesus says that if, if anyone wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. So for me, it took a while to come to a point where I was willing to let go of myself and like let go of the idea of living for myself. And that's when I had really the chance to, to find God. And it clicked that when Jesus died for my sin and my selfishness, I was no longer my own, but my entire life belonged to God. And when I got that, that's when the Bible became alive to me. I remember when I uh, first started dating my wife, Alicia, and I remember so well the times um, that we spent when we were like that falling in love phase, if you know what I mean. I had like, I remember like a special moment, we went to the Columbus Zoo, and I feel like that was kind of the first time I think we got like both kind of knew that we were falling in love. I remember we were like, we were riding back from the zoo and we were listening to uh, a song, Wild Horses. I don't know if I should, yeah, anyway, but that's like, that's always been kind of like the, the, like when we ever hear that song, we kind of look at each other, no, you know, like that's our, like our first love moment, you know, song. Um, in a similar way, I remember falling in love with Jesus through reading the Bible, and I had those first Bible love moments too. Um, a few months after I became a Christian in college, I went on a summer mission with crew to Baku, Azerbaijan. And that's when I read the New Testament for the first time. Uh, the apartment we stayed in constantly lost electricity at night. And so we would go to a nearby hotel in the area and we would read, we would go um, I mean, I had so many memories of being on the top floor of the hotel, overlooking the city, and God was blowing my mind away by how awesome he was, and I was just reading the Bible, but the words were jumping off the page, um, and it felt like it was speaking directly to me, showing me things about myself and about him, and it was so real. Those first love memories, do you, do you have those? Um, do you remember the world making sense because God was speaking to you through his word? So I don't think Macklemore would ever really get that. Like he thinks it's a book of outdated rules, but in reality, it's, it's a love letter written from God to humanity. And, you know, going back to Hebrews 4.12, that verse just took on new meaning, you know, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the vision of soul and spirit of joints and marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. If you're a follower of Jesus, um, the Bible is your lifeline. It is still mine, and it has the power to change our lives if we pick it up. When you have a relationship with someone, that relationship grows when you learn and understand more about them. And the Bible is the one great tool God has provided us to get to know him more, learn about him, learn to live for him. And if you haven't picked it up in a while, I would suggest the Gospel of John or one of the Gospels. And before you read, pray to God for insight, read a chapter, and then take notes, reflections on what you read. Um, as crew, we want to be a people of his word. And uh, would you guys pray with me 
that that would be true of us. Dear Jesus, uh, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you that we can look at and have, we have evidence to hold on to that your Bible is true. Um, at the same time, we've experienced your word um, and it's transformed our lives. I just pray that um, everyone in this Zoom call would, would be students of your word, um, that they would learn to, to, to love your revelation to them and, and that they would um, be renewed and transformed by it. I pray, Lord, that we would be people of the word. In name I pray, Jesus. Amen.